Dalton sir. Ya. Yeah. Uh, so, Dalton sir, good evening. Yeah. Sanjay, can you see me? Ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. Snimai sir. Snimai. Hello. Can you unmute yourself? There. Yes. Am I unmuted yes. now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is audible. Good evening, oh, sir, good. in India. Mark. And can you see me yeah. all right? Yes. Yes, sir. Our visitor is in the board. Okay. Now we're not set to go until another 10 minutes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Greetings, everyone. Very glad to see you there. Thank you for coming. Okay. Professor Dalton, this is Bidhu Chakravarti. I happen to be the, the vice chancellor of this university. Oh my goodness. And I'm your admirer because, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm your, you know, one of the probably most foremost admirers, you know, because oh I goodness. wrote some books on Gandhi and yes. it is your first book published in 1993 on Gandhi, which inspired me like anything. That is marvelous to hear. Thank you for that tribute. And I am honored and privileged yeah, to hear yeah. that from you, I especially mean, a Gandhi scholar. We are, we are greatly honored to have you because I uh, read your book. I knew of you, but I never had the opportunity to see you face to face. Well, so for the first know. time, yeah, for the first time, <laughs> I am seeing a kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, a hero of, of my, you know, choice. A hero because you, know, you are the ones who really inspired me to work on Gandhi. I mean, like uh, I'll mention in my introductory remarks, um, who are the persons who really inspired me to uh, start working on Gandhi. But I, I'll also tell you, I have changed my you know uh, priorities now, and I'll yes. also tell you the, the why why I changed my priority. I no longer think Gandhi is as important as I used to think. Say about five years ago. I've Whoa. got a, I've got a, another hero now. <laughs> it's and, fine to have more than one hero. That's right. <laughs> you know, I was with uh, the Professor W.H. Morris Jones at the London School of Economics. Oh my goodness. He was a very dear friend and mentor of mine. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I worked with him. Um, and then I worked uh, for quite some time at Iowa University with Paul Greeno, Philip Lurgendorf, yes. uh, Sheldon Pollock. Oh, these are my they are, they are my you know, colleagues when they were also young like me. Um, and then I shifted to Delhi for a while, and then again I went back to Iowa. I just taught in Virginia, Charlottesville, uh, in 2012 to 2000, sorry, 2010 to 2013. Yes. As, as the first Gandhi Gandhi chair in in uh, Virginia, Charlottesville, uh, Gandhi chair of nonviolence, global nonviolence. And since 2019, I am now in charge of Vishwabharati as its vice chancellor or in your terminology, its a president. So I am Congratulations, holding... sir. I am very honored to have you here today. Yeah. Extraordinary. And uh, you're very kind to say those remarks about me and about the mentors that I've had. I was yes, especially I... close to Morris Jones. Oh. Uh... He was an incredibly inspiring individual. That's and right. We yeah. Were, we were very important, very fortunate. Did you That's have right. contact with you, so as with Hugh Tinker as well? That's right. Uh, Hugh Tinker, then Phillips, Sir Phillips was there. Yes. C.H. Phillips was there at that point of time. Kane, Kane Chaudhary, he was also there. Kirti yes. yes. Chaudhary. And yes. a relatively younger scholar, David Taylor, he was also there. David uh, Taylor became then dean of the faculty later on. Yes, he was, That's right. he was just a young person in my, one of my classes. That's, That's right, right, yeah. I know, David uh, David told me about you. I, oh. I'm in touch with David. He was then, he became a vice chancellor of uh, Karachi University in Pakistan. Uh, yes, he was there he was. For, for a while, and then he went back to Suez. 
Now he is at Soas at this point of time, but um, yeah, uh, he has shifted to contemporary Indian politics, just like me. I mean, I, I began my work with um, the Bengal nationalism, middle class radicalism. Uh, again, it was you know I would say Professor Morris Jones kind of you know uh, inspiration and uh, you know forcible kind of imposition, because I wanted to work on uh, Communist Party of Great Britain, and then you know uh, he introduced me to Eric Hobsbawm. And Eric Hobsbawm uh, uh, dissuaded me not to work on this theme because your scholarship was meant for three years, and in three years you can't, you know, you don't know the society where the Communist Party emerged. So to know British society, you need to spend at least, you know, two decades, if not more. So I said I don't have scholarship for two decades, so I have to finish in three <laughs> years time. <laughs> so then Maurice Jones. <laughs> you know, then Maurice Jones said, why don't you look back to your country? And he oh. was interested in Bengal because just before me, there was a Bangladeshi scholar who worked on Muslim League and its uh, origin and you know how did it come about uh, to claim Pakistan in, in the 1940 Lahore Resolution. So uh, then he, he just said, why don't you work on that? And then I focused on middle class radicalism of Bengal in 20, 1920 to 1940. And you know, in Bengal, Gandhi was an untouchable. So, <laughs> so, so I was drawn to Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, who, oh my goodness. Wow. Uh, who, who defeated Gandhi nominated candidate Pattabhi Sitaramaiya in 1939 yes. Tripuri Congress. So I, I, as a kind of radical Bengali, I, I was naturally drawn to Subhash Chandra Bose, and I didn't like Gandhi at all. <laughs> and I thought Gandhi was the villain of Indian nationalism. But later on, I have changed. Later on, I have changed. But after having come to Vishwabharati, I have again, as I said, changed my hero. Gandhi is no longer my hero. It is Rabindranath Tagore, who is my hero now. <laughs> you made quite an intellectual journey. Thank you. That's for right. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. yeah. I enjoy, you know, shifting my interest from one place to another. But, you know, I, I continue to love you. I continue to appreciate your scholarship. Well, I haven't I changed. It. I, I haven't changed much, you know, because I, I like the Professor Dennis Dalton. And I know that Professor Dennis Dalton was one of those few intellectuals or few Gandhi scholars who inspired me to work on Gandhi. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We have so many mutual friends. That's college. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at that time, Peter Lyon was also there in Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Yes. Peter Lyon was there. Um, and here in the United States, have you met my old friend Leonard Gordon? I know, uh, Lenny. Lenny Gordon was there. Uh, he Lenny was in Gordon, yes. City College, right? He was in City College. Hmm. He, that's true, Brooklyn yeah. College. And of course, he's written a definitive biography of that's right. And his brother. Yes. Also that's right. His brother. His brother. No, that's right. Brothers against the Raj. That's right. That's, that's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So you know him from an old. Son. Yeah, I know. I know Lenny for quite some because when Lenny went to do his PhD, I was a student and I was a kind of research scholar <laughs> in Netaji Institute of Indian Studies. So I helped Lenny in, to collect material in exchange of a very uh, you know, small remuneration. It is so wonderful today to feel among friends. That's right. People yeah. who have so many colleagues in common. That's I right. We really appreciate your remarks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And I, I know Walter Hauser was my colleague at um, Virginia. Yes. Hauser, you know. Um, so, Hauser, yes, of course. Yeah. How is he now? Is he all right? I believe so. Philip Oldenburg. Did you meet Philip Oldenburg? Uh huh. Philip, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Philip is in Colombia now. Philip and Bina. Well, in... <laughs> right. You really know. <laughs> I know. I know. You have contacts all over. Yeah. <laughs> as yeah. many in India and America as in Britain. And so yeah. I... But you know, I now now you'll be surprised um, to know the name of another person who you know, I'm sure. Uh, Ronald Tarchek. Ron Tarchek. Yes, of course. Yeah. A great Gandhi scholar. That's right. His yeah. book on Gandhi's autonomy. That's right. Yeah. Talking. That's yes, it. Ron, Ron was a very dear friend of mine. In fact, oh, I, I don't know see. whether you saw my book on Gandhi and Martin Luther of King course. Jr. So yes, it was Ron. Yes, it was Ron, you know, who was uh, who was again, you know, 
who inspired me to undertake this kind of you know uh, research yes. work when I was in Virginia. You and were I in attended, Virginia. I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, Virginia, Charlottesville. I was there for three years. Ah, then you knew Church there. Then. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the world is too small, uh, Professor Dalton. You have a wider experience than I have <laughs> in terms of yeah. the journey that you've made. I haven't studied Subhash Bose closely. I did, uh, I think, develop the same sort of feeling about Bose versus Gandhi. And I'm glad that I'm not talking about Bose today, uh, but uh -huh. rather Tagore. It would That's be right. very difficult for me to talk about Bose. Yeah. Now, before I think we start, uh, I must express yeah. my gratitude to my student, Sanjeev. You know, Sanjeev is the one who, yeah, yeah, Sanjeev is the one who, who uh, brought you first. Good and evening, then sir. I told, ask I'm Sanjeev, here. I asked Sanjeev that give me the Professor Dalton's email ID. I would like to invite him in our university lecture series. So it is because of Sanjeev, we got uh, you. And I'm telling this to all my uh, you, colleagues in Vishwabharati. That Sanjeev Kumar is a student of mine in Delhi University. He is a Gandhi, he's a growing, I think, upcoming Gandhi scholar. Yes. And I think I have inspired him. Yeah, to, definitely. To, sir, I'm he, here. I'm listening to you, sir. Uh, uh, I'm here. Uh, yeah, I can call. see you. I can see oh, you. Okay, can, great, sir. Great, great to see both of you. In fact, Professor yes, Dalton, good evening. <laughs> and yeah. sir has been always been all along my journey, you know. The little that I know about Gandhi, he has inspired me. You know. Well, you have youth on your side, Sanjeev. <laughs> and uh, I. Yeah, a little look bit. To you, as a young Gandhi scholar. Uh, for the <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that you know I, I've been able to inspire this one scholar, you know, who will remember me even after my death. <laughs> oh, of course. <clears throat> of course he will. Yeah, and, and we've got about. scholars from Vishwabharati. You know, they are quite you know excited to have you around because you are so well known in our part of the world, <laughs> given your work, and you are a wonderful human being. I mean, that I can make out. You know, after having talked to you, so I'm sure you say it's a benefit for us um, uh, away from the United States. And it's morning for you, but it's uh, seven o'clock in the evening. So before I, uh, you know, uh, we waste much of our time. Let's start um, the, the proceedings. Uh, Professor Dalton, you know, as you know, it, is, it was founded by uh, the great poet Rabindranath Tagore in 1921. And uh, when we uh, start a formal kind of event, we normally start it with a Vedic so song. It's a kind of, you know, invoking the Almighty, you know, to help us gain what we would like to uh, gain. And uh, so the, say, we'll start with the Vedic hymns. It's a, in the form of a song. We have got somebody from our music department. He's pretty good. And Dr. then Manush. we'll start the actual proceedings. So Nimai, yes, if sir. you think you're ready, Manush can start. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. my request to you, Professor Dalton, you know, to show respect to uh, the, the founder of this university, we normally stand up when these Vedic hymns are enchanted. So I request you to just stand up, you know, to show respect. And so Manos, should we Manos. Samani, Samanan, 
conceptual importance of Gandhian ideas. And I just uh, uh, talking to him before the uh, beginning of this session that um, uh, he's one of the persons who inspired me to look into Gandhi as a political thinker. And along with him, I was also indebted to Raghavan Iyer, uh, and then B.R. Nanda and uh, Ron Tarchek. You know, these are the four persons, you know, I mentioned who really, whose writings, so writing inspired me because I met uh, some of the, I mean, today I meet the last person because I met Raghavan Iyer, I met Ron Tarchek. I also worked with B.R. Nanda for a while. Now for the first time I'm being introduced to Professor Dennis Dalton. I see him face to face. Um, and you know, his book, um, the Mahatma Gandhi and the power of nonviolent action you know, is a book which um, uh, uh, introduced a new, new uh, you know, area of uh, conceptualizing Gandhian thought. Uh, and he, you know, if, you, if you read the book, you'll find that he was the one who was trying to um, link uh, Gandhian ideas with the context in which he evolved all those ideas. So that also shows a new approach um, to um, political thought. So, President Dalton, we are really honored that you uh, have agreed to um, uh, spend some of your precious time with us. And in Vishwa Bharati, we are quite for, uh, fortunate to have you around. And I told you that we would not have got you without Sanjeev's contribution. So I also express my thanks to Sanjeev formally. Um, and about this lecture series, you know, uh, I joined Vishwa Bharati in 2018, and since 2019, I started this lecture series. And um, there are some good scholars um, who uh, talked in, in this lecture series. You are the 43rd, I, the 42nd. You are the 42nd scholar um, uh, who uh, has you know, uh, really participated in this uh, important lecture series. 
and um, normally we get people from various fields and we expect the scholars to be very general generic because we have got uh, faculties from science from agriculture uh, from music you know from uh, arts and aesthetics and also from social sciences you know for social sciences probably you know whatever you say it's will be very easily intelligible but uh, i think to make the science people interested to know gandhi because you know I, i've been i have been talking about gandhi for quite some time and whenever i get a chance i prefer to talk about gandhi just to you know acquaint people with gandhian ideas and gandhian thought and also the gandhian practice but as i said a few minutes ago i i think gandhi is a great scholar a great thinker but the greatest thinker happens to be rabindranath tagore i mean some of the ideas which gandhi popularized in the early part of the 20th century tagore actually you know um, uh, I, i would say you know there was a precursor of those ideas long before gandhi put it into practice so i think now i'm working on tagore and i found that in a number of ways you know tagore was a kind of forerunner in so far as some of the ideas which gandhi Uh, talked about later in the 20th century so this university lecture series is essentially a kind of bridge between the renowned scholar all over the world and uh, with uh, our our scholars in this campus and bishwarth campus i i'm sure you know something about it it is uh, specifically a campus which tried to develop an alternative pedagogy um, uh, initiated by rubindra tagore in the context of the uh, colonialism um, he wanted to develop um, vishwa bharati as a kind of challenge to the modern edu education to english education and that's why he shifted his uh, headquarter from calcutta the british capital of india to vishwa uh, bharati shantiniketan which is about 168 km east of calcutta so and then he developed uh, initially he started with the school that was in 1901 and then you know the vishwavarti came into being in 1921 so it is going on you know it is it is very special kind of university because it's not a uh, conventional uh, center of learning um, here you will find students still you know studying under the in the open um, and you know the, the departments which are there they are not uh, very conventional department very unconventional department because he tried to imbibe the spirit of tapoban shiksha tapoban education and that's why you know you started with, uh, that we start with vedic song, song and you know whatever you will find in his ideas um, they are dependent largely on upanishads basically and here he is indebted to his father and his grandfather dwarkanath and devendranath and um, his you know enormous quantity of text which are written mainly in vernacular bengali um, are really quite fascinating and i feel bad that tagore um, uh, didn't become a kind of you know didn't get the uh, uh, what is called uh, uh, accolade which he should have simply because he wrote mainly in vernacular i mean gandhi became a global leader simply because his ideas were easily intelligible to those who don't even know understand any of the indian languages because he wrote mostly in english and his uh, text was translated by his able secretary mahadev desai now in case of tagore you will uh, you don't find that kind of stuff here tagore wrote himself and he uh, translated some of them in english i mean gitanjali for instance he uh, gave a draft to um, the poet yates and he you know put it before the global audience after editing after properly editing it so i think you know because of the lack of um, you know availability of tagore's writings in english here is relatively unknown to the rest of the world so that's why and the more i read about tagore the more fascinated i become because here is a person who wrote on every areas of humanity because his his main uh, concern is to establish universal humanism you know and he didn't like uh, i mean there are many debates in he he didn't appreciate the idea of nationalism for instance just like gandhi but um, he never participated in politics directly his uh, language of protest was still little different was very subtle so um, you have to go, uh, read in between lines to understand what he wanted to mean you know uh, vis a vis british colonialism i mean there is a kind of misconception that um, uh, since he didn't you know 
fight the British directly, he was identified as one of the British loyalists, which is um, entirely wrong um, because uh, he was not as um, active as Gandhi was, but he was actually in his writings, he was far more revolutionary um, in his thoughts. So now when I read his text in between lines, I understand that you know, uh, he was far more revolutionary in, in many ways, but because of his um, uh, writings, mostly in Bangla or in a vernacular, um, his ideas are not so globally known. So hopefully uh, once I write books in English, you know, it will be known, it will reach you as well. And Rabindranath probably will have a different kind of perception. I mean, he's basically known as a literary figure. No, I'm questioning that. I'm saying he's more than that. He was actually in a, just a Gandhi. Gandhi is mainly reduced to being a political activist. And you, you had shown that it was, it was his outer manifestation. I mean, to run a political campaign, you need to have an ideational you know, universe. So uh, Tagore also you know, had his own ideational universe, which was um, uh, different from that of his contemporary nationalist colleagues. So I'm trying to find out, you know, through by reading his text, by uh, on the contrary, rereading the text, which he wrote to, to prove that he was also a political activist, not in the sense Gandhi was, but in his, you know, in my, in mental universe, he was very much radical and very much anti-British in his feelings and in his, you know, uh, sentiments. So we are looking forward to your interpretation, to your kind of, you know, energetic uh, speech. And um, here I request my colleague, Professor Vipasa Raha, who belongs to the Department of History uh, to take up from me and introduce the uh, speaker of today. Um, and then you know, she will conduct the entire program from now on. And at the end, I'll come to thank you. Yeah. Okay, Vipasa. Thank you, sir. It is my... Uh really my proud privilege today to be able to introduce Professor Dennis Dalton, but as Sir just said, he really needs no introduction in the world of Indian academia. We are all familiar with his uh, Indian idea of freedom that discusses the political thought of some of our, uh, in some of our Indian luminaries, and of course, Mahatma Gandhi nonviolent power in action. So I will just say a few words about him. Dr. Dalton is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Bernard College, Columbia University. He did his BA from Rutgers University and MA from the University of Chicago in Political Science. Uh, then he went on to do his PhD in Political Theory from the University of London. In his uh, long illustrious career, Dr. Dalton has been honored with numerous teaching awards, grants, and scholarships that include, among others, the Bernard College Margaret Mead Award 2009 for Distinguished Teaching, Bernard Commendation for Excellence in Teaching in 2008, then a grant from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Gandhi Peace Foundation grant, a senior Fulbright scholarships and many others. He has authored several erudite articles and is uh, associated with some noted journals. I'm very happy to welcome him here. Uh, and with these few words, may I now request Professor Dalton to deliver your talk. I won't say anything else by way of introduction. Professor Dalton. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. I feel pleased, humbled in the presence of the distinguished scholars and people whom I recall, Chuck, Professor Chakrabarty and I were discussing before uh, the number of people that we've met. I think we didn't mention one of my mentors near Malcolmar Bose, whom I, met, whom I met when I first arrived in India in 1961. Um, he, Carol Nair, Sushila Nair, uh, they were people who brought me closely in touch with Gandhiji. Now I'm calling my talk today, Tagore Gandhi Debate, 
an exemplary exchange of ideas. And when we consider Tagore, we think of him as a revered thinker, Nobel poet, world prophet, who established and named Vishwabharati, India and the world, or the world in India. This is the country, India, whose monumental intellectual tradition I've been fortunate to study earnestly since first landing on its shores in 1960. I lived then in the villages of South Asia, not as a missionary or a government official, but to learn of its culture. And it's that that fascinated me. In my lifetime of researching and teaching this subject, two leaders, Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore, emerged who intrigued me so much that I focus on them in my PhD dissertation written for the School of Oriental and African Studies as early as 1965, as was mentioned, and have pursued their thought ever since. So we begin our analysis today between Gandhi and Tagore with a characteristic tribute that to Gandhi paid to Tagore on October 13, 1921, notably at the height of the non-cooperation campaign. Gandhi wrote, quote, I regard the poets as a sentinel warning us against the approach of enemies called bigotry, lethargy, intolerance, ignorance, and other members of that brood. While this comes as a fair and accurate phrase of Tagore, it fails to mention nationalism as among those enemies, because this became the core of their dialogue. Tagore challenged courageously the dominant political belief of his age and of modern Indian politics, the gospel of nationalism. Gandhi had extolled the ideal of universal, universal harmony, like Tagore, but Gandhi had not singled out Indian nationalism as a threat to that ideal. His criticism was rather reserved for the Western nation-state system. Tagore, on the contrary, asserted that in principle, there was no distinction among these different forms of nationalism. Nationalism is a great menace, he said. It is the particular thing which for years has been at the bottom of India's trouble. And Tagore not only declared his position in unequivocal terms, he made the theme of individual freedom versus the nation state a central feature of his social and political thought. So this lecture will consider his criticism of nationalism and its various manifestations in uh, all aspects of his thought. And we'll deal especially with it in the context of his eloquent dialogue with Mahatma Gandhi. The Guru's case against nationalism was originally made against the Western nation state system. And it, at its base was Tagore's disillusionment over the events of the Boer War. Appalled with the brutality, the futility of the Boer War, sensing the deeper implications of the attitude which it represented, Tagore expressed his feelings in a brilliant sonnet composed on the last day of the 19th century. Tagore wrote, quote, the last sun of the century sets amidst the blood red clouds of the West and the whirlwind of hatred, the naked passion of nations. 
and their self-love in a drunken delirium of greed and dancing to the clash of steel and the howling versus of vengeance. The hungry self of the nation shall burst in a violence of fury from its own shameless eating. For it has made the world its food. And this poem, which is so precious because it was written 14 years before World War I broke out, it concludes with a warning to India to keep watch and again to quote, be not ashamed, my brothers, to stand before the proud and the powerful with your white robe of symbolism. Let your crown be of humility, your freedom, the freedom of the soul. B build God's throne daily upon the ample bareness of your poverty. And know that what is huge is not great, and pride is not everlasting. Once again, notice the date here, 1899, at the turn of the 20th century. And Gandhi at this time is utterly unknown. We need to appreciate then Tagore as a true prophet because the events of the subsequent century, that is the 20th century, only increased Tagore's brilliance, his prescience, and his fear of nationalism. He had a desire for international harmony and uh, when the war broke out, he was crushed in terms of his thought over the menace of nationalism. And to his, in his great poem, Gitanjali, he yearned for an age of freedom, quote, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into its fragments by domestic narrow walls. And so with the outbreak of the First World War in August of 1914, not long after he wrote to Tunjali, all Tagore's fears seemed to him confirmed. His cry of protest came in three lectures on nationalism, delivered in 1916. And notice again the courage involved that he should have moved around the world, giving these lectures against nationalism. Two years after the First World War, with all its fierce nationalism had broken out. And so these lectures that he gave comprised a frontal attack on an idea which had then reached its apogee. And de Gore directed his attack against nationalism throughout the whole world. He called his lectures nationalism in the West, nationalism in Japan, nationalism in India. The primary concern that dominates these lectures is that of the suppression of individual freedom by the cult of nationalism. And to quote him, this nationalism is a cruel epidemic of evil that is sweeping over the human world of the present age and eating into its moral vitality. In Japan, he went on, the voluntary submission of the whole people to the trimming of their minds and the clipping of their freedom by their government, which through various educational agencies regulates their thoughts, manufactures their feelings, has led to an acceptance of an all-pervading mental slavery with cheerfulness and pride because of their nervous desire to turn themselves into a machine of power called the nation. In the West, nationalism has corrupted the colonizers no less than the colonies. Not merely the subject races, the Gore went on now speaking directly to America, but you who live under the delusion that you are free are every day sacrificing your freedom and your humanity to this fetish of nationalism, living in a dense poisonous atmosphere 
of worldwide suspicion and greed and panic. The end of the quote. Tagore was most distressed, not with the prevalence of nationalism in the West, but with its infection in India. The idea was a Western importation, of course, but Tagore realized that his own countrymen in India, especially his Bengali contemporaries, had developed nationalism into a peculiar Indian variety. Bhagam Chandra, for example, Vivekananda, Vivekan Chandra Paul, Aurobindo, were the main philosophers of early Indian nationalism. And ironically, as Tagore was in America preaching against nationalism, C.R. Das, another Bengali, and a great leader of India at that time, was telling his Indian audience. To quote from C.R. Das, I find in the con conception of my country, my nation, the expression also of divinity. With me, C.R. Das concluded, nationality is no mere political conception borrowed from the philosophy of the West. I value this principle of nationalism as I value the principle of morality and religion. That was C.R. Das. And we want to emphasize then the way in which Bengalis, various types, as well as, of course, people throughout India, embraced this Western idea of nationalism and made it their own. The greatest disservice which nationalism had rendered India the Gore argued was to have directed the country's attention away from its own primary needs. And the quote from Tagore, our real problem in India is not political, it is social. The nationalist urge leads to a pursuit of political goals to the neglect of pressing social problems. The end of the quote. Neither the Congress nationalists nor the extremists, according to Devor, realized this critical need for social reform. The moderates had no constructive idea, no sense of what nationalism most needed was constructive work coming from within herself, Devor argued. And the moderates lost power because the people soon came to realize how futile was the half policy adopted by that at the end of a quote in his critique of the moderates. The extremists, on the other hand, mainly the Bengali extremists, pretended to root the program in traditional Indian truths, but in reality, they were nothing but advocates of Western nationalism. And again, to quote from Tagore, the extremist ideals were based on Western history. They had no sympathy with the special problems of India. They didn't realize and recognize the patent fact that there were causes in our social organization, which made the Indian capable of coping with the alien. The domination in India of the caste system, which Tagore castigated, condemned, and the blind and lazy habit of relying upon the authority of traditions, to go to continue, that are incongruous anachronisms in the present age. Think of the prophetic nature of this. Now, De Gore is speaking at this time against political leaders in his own country with extraordinary courage. Nationalism cannot prompt a social and moral reform of the nature that's needed. This is one of his main themes. Rather, it will only whet the popular appetite for increased political warfare. The real task before India, he argued, is that of building a good society. And uh, a quote from Tagore, Society is the expression of those moral and spiritual aspirations of man which belong to his higher nature, not his lower. 
if Tagore, if India, Tagore believes, pursues political independence to the exclusion of all else, then India may attain a sovereign state, yes, but it will be one in which the old social and moral maladies are not purged, but rather magnified. Above all, a narrow quest for political liberty will only obscure India's real goal, which must always remain that of moral and spiritual freedom for the individual and society. And now a lengthy quotation from de Gaulle's nationalism, his classic work, of course, the collection of the essays uh, that he lectures and essays that he gave in Japan and America and India. This quotation from de Gaulle's nationalism before we begin his dialogue with Gandhi. He wrote, our social ideals create the human world, but when our mind is diverted from them to greed of power, then in that state of intoxication, we live in a world of abnormality where our strength is not held and our liberty is not freedom. Therefore, political freedom does not give us freedom when our mind is not free. An automobile does not create freedom of movement because it's a mere machine. When I myself am free, I can use the automobile for the purpose of my freedom. We must never forget, he went on, in the present day, that those people who have got their political freedom are not necessarily free. They're merely powerful. The passions which are unbridled in them are creating huge organizations of slavery in the disguise of freedom. Those who have made the gain of money their highest end are unconsciously selling their life and soul to rich persons or to the combinations that represent money. Those who are enamored of their political power and gloat over their extension of dominion over foreign races gradually surrender their own freedom and humanity to the organizations necessary for holding other peoples in slavery. In the so-called free country, the majority of the people are not free. They're driven by the minority to a goal which is not even known to them. This becomes possible only because people do not acknowledge moral and spiritual freedom as their object. They create huge eddies with their passion and they feel dizzily inebriated with the mere velocity of their whirling movement, taking that to be freedom. But the doom which is waiting to overtake them is as certain as death. For man's truth, his moral life, and his emancipation is in the spiritual life. The general opinion of the majority of the present day nationalists in India is that we have come to a final completeness in our social and spiritual ideals. The task of the constructive work, I'm still quoting directly from de Gaulle's nationalism, the constructive work of society having been done several thousand years before we were born and that now we are free to employ all our activities in this political direction. We never dream of blaming our social inadequacy as the origin of our present helplessness. For we've accepted as the creed of our nationalism that this social system has been perfected for all time to come by our ancestors. This is the reason why we think that our one task is to build a political miracle of freedom upon the quicksand of social slavery. Those of us in India who have come under the delusion that mere political freedom will make us free have accepted their lessons from the West as the gospel truth and lost their faith in humanity. 
we must remember whatever weakness we cherish in our society will become the source of danger in politics. The same inertia which leads us to our idolatry of dead forms in social institutions will create in our politics prison houses with immovable walls. The narrowness of sympathy, which makes it possible for us to impose upon a considerable portion of humanity the galling yoke of inferiority, will assert itself in our politics in creating the tyranny of injustice. So that's the long quote that I've read from de Gore's classic political work, nationalism. And now we turn to the de Gore Gandhi controversy. Now, many of the ideas which de Gore voices in the above passage that I just read from nationalism are in profound agreement with Gandhi, as well as with other Indian leaders at this time, such as Vivekananda and Aurobindo. All agree ultimately on the primary need for social reform in India, as well as on the supremacy of moral or spiritual freedom. Tagore's unique contribution rests with his early and emphatic assertion that though India's adoption of nationalism might further the struggle for independence, it could only thwart the essential quest for moral and spiritual freedom. This point of view inevitably sparked off a controversy with India's arch nationalist, Mahatma Gandhi. And now we quote from Gandhi in this dialogue, writing in October 1921, once again, during uh, the non cooperation movement that Gandhi is leading. Gandhi wrote, Indian nationalism is not exclusive, nor aggressive, nor destructive. Indian nationalism, Gandhi contended, to quote directly from him, is health-giving, religious, and therefore humanitarian. Now this is Gandhi replying to Tagore's criticism. And the criticisms are directed at Tagore. So the view which Gandhi expresses here accurately represents his general position on Indian nationalism. It may, it may rightly be argued that Gandhi did not advocate many of the forms of nationalism which had sprung up around 1900 in Bengal. Gandhi did not see the nation in accord with C.R. Das, for example, as a transcendent entity possessed of a soul and a form of freedom of its own, apart from its individual human components. Gandhi thought of Swaraj in terms first of the individual and then of society. Swaraj of the people, he said, means the sum total of the Swaraj self-rule of individuals. And yet, although Gandhi was not an exponent of nationalism after the fashion of Bipin Chandra Paul, C.R. Das, his ideas did support other forms of nationalism, which Gandhi frankly endorsed and which, as Tagore soon discovered, posed threats to individual freedom. And so in March 1919, Gandhi called upon the people of India to observe April 6th as a mass hartal, a day of fasting public meetings, suppression of labor, suspension of labor. The intent was to mobilize popular opposition to the government's enactment of the Rollout Bill. The effect of the Hartle was to demonstrate the considerable power potential of the non-cooperation program. And so on April 12th, Tagore wrote to Gandhi from Shanti Niketan, urging him to exercise caution in the use of non-cooperation. Tagore's letter represents the first written evidence of his qualms over Gandhi's emerging political leadership. 
as I said, April 6th, or April 12th, rather, of 1919. Tagore wrote, power in all of its forms is irrational. It is like the horse that drags the carriage blindfolded. And so Tagore expresses grave concern over recent acts of government repression, as in the rollout bills. Yet he questioned the good that could come from pressing the non-cooperation fur movement further. And so Tagore continued to quote from Tagore, I have always felt and said accordingly that the great gift of freedom can never come to a people through charity. We must win it before we can own it. And India's opportunities for winning it will come to her when she can prove that she is morally superior to the people who rule her by their right of conquest. Well, that's the end of the quote from Tagore, aimed at Gandhi. The present non-cooperation movement didn't seem to Tagore representative of India's moral superiority. And he concluded his letter directly to Gandhi with these telling lines. A quote from De Gore, I pray most fervently that nothing that tends to weaken our spiritual freedom may intrude into your marching line, that martyrdom for the cause of truth may never degenerate into fanaticism for mere verbal forms, descending into the self-defense that hides itself behind a moral name, the end of that powerful quote from Tagore to Gandhi. Tagore then sailed for England and America early the next year in 1920. And while abroad, he seems to have made up his mind as to whether Gandhi's movement had in fact degenerated into fanaticism from mere ver more verbal form, hiding itself behind a moral name. And so he wrote uh, to a friend, Charles Andrews, I wish I were the little creature Jack. He wrote from Chicago in reference to the non-cooperation campaign, whose one mission, Tagore continued, is to kill the giant abstraction, the abstraction of nationalism which is claiming the sacrifice of individuals all over the world under highly painted masks of delusion. In July 1921, he returned to India after 14 months abroad. And he confronted the campaign at its peak. His battle against the giant abstraction, to use his term, soon began in earnest. And so on August 29, 1921, Tagore delivered at a Calcutta public meeting an address entitled The Call of Truth. This is a remarkable commentary by Tagore, for it's offered at once both as a trenchant criticism of Gandhi's leadership and an eloquent defense of individual freedom with which Gandhi above all Indian leaders at this time, had identified himself. The Gore begins, then, his remarks with a proposition common to Vivekananda, Aurobindo, and Gandhi. It's the nature of man, he said, to struggle for self-realization or spiritual freedom. This must remain in the individual's highest aim and success may only be gained through conquest of his own self, reiterating a maxim which both he and Gandhi had stressed for the last decade. Tagore said, they who have failed to attain Swaraj within themselves must lose it in the outside world too. Political independence was a great desideratum, but it was not Swaraj. Nor could it even ensure Swaraj. 
if not act accompanied by a moral or spiritual transformation of the individual in society. De Gore often expressed his ideas through metaphor. In the Call of Truth lecture, he drew on this medium of metaphor to set forth his conception of the relation of social and moral to political reform. The metaphor is De Gore's own, but the idea was shared by Gandhi. So here's another long quotation from De Gore, this time from his 1921 lecture in Calcutta, entitled The Call of Truth. To quote from De Gore, when we turn our gaze upon the progress of other nations, the political cart horse comes prominently into view. On it seems to depend wholly the speed of the vehicle. We forget that the cart behind the horse must also be in a fit state to move. Its wheels must have the right alignment. Its parts must have been properly assembled. The cart is the product not simply of materials on which saw and hammer had worked, thought, energy, and application have gone into its making. We've seen countries that are outwardly free, but as they are drawn by the horse of politics, the rattle rouses all the neighborhood from sleep and the jolting makes the limbs of the passengers in this cart ache. The vehicles break down repeatedly on their way and to put them in running order is a terrific business. Yet they are vehicles of a sort after all. The fragments that pass for our country not only lack cohesion, <clears throat> as in the case of this cart, but are comprised of parts at odds with one another. To hitch this horse to a cart that is ridden with anger and avarice or some other passion, drags it along painfully with much din and bustle and driving this political progress. How long can this driving force last in the face of our social inequity? Is it not wiser then to keep the horse in the stable for the time and take up the task first of putting the vehicle of moral advancement of society in good shape? Now from this passage, at the end of that quote from The Call of Truth. From this passage may be anticipated the nature of the criticism as follows. It consists in effect in this dialogue between Tagore and Gandhi of Tagore turning Gandhi's own arguments against him. Because while abroad, Tagore says, he had heard nothing but high praise of Gandhi's non-cooperation movement. And he had come to believe from this that India was at last on the path to what he called real liberation. Then, in a chilling paragraph, he tells of what he found on his return to India in 1921. To quote from Tagore, so in the excited expectation of breathing the air of a newfound freedom, I hurried back to my homeland. But what I've seen and felt troubles me. Something seems to be weighing on the people's spirit. A stern pressure is at work. It makes everyone talk in the same voice and make the same gestures. That's the end of quote. A scathing indictment then of Gandhi's non-cooperation movement at this time in 1921. And so this climate of opinion, de Gore believed, was a manifestation of nationalism at its worst. Slave mentality, as he called it, of this nature, rather than alien rule, is our real enemy. And through its defeat alone can Swaraj within and without come to us. Gandhi's directives 
which urged, among other things, the manual spinning of yarn, the burning of foreign cloth, were not weighed by critical minds to your belief. Rather, they had been accepted as dogma. And, quote from de Gore, as dogma takes the place of reason, freedom will give way to some kind of despotism, end of quote. Now, that's a harsh criticism of Gandhi in this invigorating, brilliant dialogue between them. Tagore himself remained then highly critical of Gandhi's directives. He found Gandhi's dicta on spinning and cloth burning negative, destructive. He said, Swaraj is not a matter of mere self-sufficiency in the production of cloth. It's real place. He argued, is within us. The mind with its diverse power goes on building Swaraj for itself. <clears throat> That's his quotation from, from the call of truth. These particular tenets of Gandhi struck to Gore as medieval in their compulsive desire for simplicity. They closed the doors, he argues, to economic or spiritual advance. In their rabid advocacy of a narrow form of Swadesh, they cramped Indian attitude into a restricted provincial mold, inhibiting the mind's diverse power to go on building Swaraj for itself. And a quote from de Gore, as everywhere else, Swaraj in this country has to find its basis in the mind's unfoldment, in knowledge, in scientific thinking, not in shallow gestures. Gandhi's approach to social reform, de Gore contended, would not stimulate the mind's unfoldment, but rather restrict its development and lead to its atrophy. On a national level, this approach would result in a deplorable attitude of isolationism and hostility toward the rest of the world. And so the call of truth, this eloquent lecture delivered at this time in 1921 in Calcutta, ends with a characteristic appeal to answer the urgent call of universal humanity by shedding the limitations of narrow nationalism, recognizing the vast dimensions of India and its world context. De Gore concluded this speech Henceforth, any nation which seeks isolation for itself must come into conflict with the time spirit and find no peace. From now onward, the plane of thinking of every nation will have to be international. It is the striving of the new age to develop in the mind this faculty of universality. <clears throat> You can see then where Tagore's Tagar, mind is. It's on the world, and in India in the world. The Tagore Gandhi controversy is therefore focused on two aspects of the meaning of freedom or Swaraj. Tagore argued first that on a domestic level, Indians had placed themselves in bondage through their unthinking acceptance of arbitrary dicta. They idolized a leader who, however saintly, had harnessed their blind allegiance to the gospel of nationalism. They had harnessed themselves then to a gospel of retardation rather than growth. And then a second and related feature of, of Gandhi's teaching was its implications on the international level. Gandhi's ideas, Tagore argued, had fostered for the most part an unhealthy sense of separateness, which foolishly spurned the knowledge and advances of the Western world. Each of these attitudes inhibited India's growth and thus restricted her freedom. Now, Gandhi, in this exciting and stimulating 
invigorating dialogue. Gandhi replied to the first of Tagore's charges that he did not wish to produce, quote, a death-like sameness in the nation, but rather to use the spinning wheel to realize the essential and living oneness of interest among India's masses. It's the end of quote from Gandhi. Spinning was not intended to replace all other forms of activity, but rather to symbolize sacrifice for the whole nation. And then Gandhi went on <clears throat> in a direct, direct response to Gore's Call of Truth lecture. If the poets, Rabindranath not to Gore, span half an hour daily, his poetry would gain in richness, for it would then represent the poor man want and woes in a more forcible manner than it does now. Spinning, and at the end of that quote, directed at the Lord, spinning for Gandhi then was a symbolic form of self-sacrifice for the masses. Tagore, however, remained suspicious of any such <clears throat> abstract appeal. And he tended to identify their symbolism with aspects of Indian nationalism. Moreover, when de Gaulle accused Gandhi of narrow provincialism, Gandhi replied, to quote from Gandhi, I hope I am as great a believer in free air as the great poets de Gaulle. I do not want, this is one of Gandhi's famous metaphors, I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides and my windows to be stopped. I want the cultures of all the land to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any." End of quote. And when Tagore warned Gandhi of the inevitable danger inherent in Gandhi's nationalism. Gandhi argued, quote, my patriotism is not exclusive. It is calculated not only to hurt, not only not to hurt any other nation, but to benefit all in the true sense of the word. India's freedom as conceived by me can never be a menace to the world. And yet, despite these assurances that Gandhi gave, Gandhi did espouse an extreme form of Indian nationalism. He said, to quote Gandhi, the interests of my country are identical with those of my religion. The attainment of national independence is to me a search after truth. Now, considering the fact that Gandhi held nothing more sacred than his religion and the quest for truth. It's clear how highly he placed the interests of his country and the struggle for Indian independence. The Gord detected in such feelings a threat to individual freedom, that he himself was reviled by his countrymen, criticized for his heretical criticism of the non-cooperation movement, accused of everything from high treason to an inveterate jealousy of Gandhi, suggests that Tagore's fear of what he called the giant abstraction was not altogether unjustified. Gandhi did contribute as a political leader and thinker to the growth of Indian nationalism as much as any figure of his century. And nowhere does he seem to recognize the implicit danger in nationalism to individual freedom, as well as to India's own free development vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. On the contrary, Gandhi dismissed all attacks on Indian nationalism, not only from Tagore, but also from his Western friends as totally without foundation. Charles Andrews, a close friend of both Gandhi and Tagore, 
perhaps Gandhi's closest British friend, wrote to Gandhi with shock and dismay in December 1921 concerning the burning of foreign cloth over the boycott of course. The picture of your lighting that great pile, Andrew said to Gandhi, including beautiful fabrics, shocked me intensely. We seem, Andrew said, to be losing sight of the great beautiful world to which we belong and concentrating selfishly only on India. This must, I fear, lead back to the old, bad, selfish nationalism. If so, we get into the vicious cycle from which Europe is now trying so desperately to escape. Now think about this quotation from C.F. Andrews, the closest of friends to both Gandhi and Tagore, writing in September 1921 when the ravages of World War I were clear and the savage, terrible cost of World War I was evident. And de Gaulle is saying here that India will be led back to that old, bad, selfish nationalism. Gandhi was struck hard by this coming from his closest British friend. But he replied to Andrews, quote, in all I do or advise, the infallible test I apply is whether the particular action will hold good in regard to the nearest and the dearest, India. Gandhi thus concludes, quote from Gandhi, Experience shows that the richest gifts must be destroyed without compensation and hesitation if they hinder moral progress. And so Gandhi will not retreat at all from the boycott of British goods burning this foreign cloth. On this point of view, Tagore made a telling observation. He said, quote, Experience has led me to dread not so much evil itself as tyrannical attempts to create goodness. A punitive police, political or moral, I have a wholesome horror. The state of slavery which is thus brought on is the most worst, is the worst form of cancer to which humanity is subject. So his criticism of Gandhi here could not be more direct. And in this case, his agreement with C.F. Andrews complete. Tagore, almost alone in his time among Indian leaders, insisted not only that there might may be more than one path to moral progress, but also that the greatest obstacle to be found on each of these paths was the slave mentality that characterized nationalism. I'll conclude this lecture with a quotation from a letter that Tagore wrote on October 11, 1916, to his son Ratindranath. Tagore had just landed in America at this time, 1916. In fact, he landed on the West Coast, not far from Portland, Oregon, where I'm speaking to you now through the magic of technology and Zoom. Tagore had finished speaking against nationalism in Japan. And as he started his series of lectures in the United States, courageously warning a chauvinistic nation against enlisting in the First World War, because remember, the United States at this time in 1916 was just about <coughs> to enter the First World War in 1917, with the cause of nationalism always behind it. He expressed, Tagore expressed his 
vision of how his university in Shanti, the university that I'm speaking to now, should engage with East and West alike. Tagore wrote that the abiding spirit of this new school, school that you, as distinguished scholar, represent teaching committed to, this new school he was writing in 1916, must serve as, quote, the connecting thread between India and the world. I have to found, he said, a world center for the study of humanity there. The days of petty nationalism are numbered. <clears throat> Let the first step towards universal union occur in the fields of Balkan. I want to make that place somewhere beyond the limits of nation and geography. The first flag of victorious universal humanism will be planted there to rid the world of its suffocating coils of national pride will be the task of my remaining years in founding this university. And once again, I consider it now my privilege, my honor, to be speaking to this university that Tagore envisaged when he was writing to his son in October, 1916. This university now, to the credit of people like Professor Chakravarti, is now within us in America too. Thank you very much uh, for your attention in this lecture. And now I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This was a fascinating talk, one of the best that I've heard. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, your experience of uh, Gandhi's ideas and the comparison with uh, Tagore. Uh, it was just simply fascinating. Uh, it is true. It is true that uh, the major part of his arguments were written in letters. So uh, the major part of his ideas were contained in the letters that he wrote to C.F. Andrews. I, for uh, myself, uh, is fascinated by what he wrote about Swaraj. You mentioned it. He wrote, uh, what is Swaraj? It is Maya. It is like a mist that will vanish, leaving no stone on the radiance of the eternal. This he wrote to C.F. Andrews in 1921 in a letter, uh, which actually uh, sums up much of his ideas. And you talked about the uh, idea of uh, passive resistance and uh, his ideas on non-cooperation. Tagore was not really... Uh, accepting what uh, Gandhi was asking about passive resistance. He refused to uh, join the movement. Uh, so it was a fascinating analysis. First of all, I, could, I would like to take a few questions. Uh, there is one question in the chat box uh, by uh, Shashwata Bhattacharji. Sir, how much Gandhi was influenced by Tagore's ideas of self-reliance as recorded in his essay Swadeshi Swamaj, uh, Samaj in 1904 or his efforts of rural reconstruction. Can you please comment something on C.R. Das's stand and his relationship with both Tagore and Gandhi on the issues of international fraternity and nationalism? Thank you. Well, as I said, in terms of C.R. Dash, he was an unequivocal, forceful advocate of Indian nationalism and a great leader at this time from Bengal. But 
he had differences with Gandhi. There's no secret about that. Uh, Professor Chakravarti earlier said how Gandhi was not received well in Bengal. And C.R. Das is a key Bengali leader, uh, didn't receive Gandhi terribly well. Uh, so there was disagreement between them. Uh, the idea of Swaraj, as you know, came from Biji Tilak and uh, the extremists, as well as or, Sri Aurobindo Goes. Uh, these figures preceded Gandhi. Uh, so the, the quotation that uh, you gave at this time was before Gandhi wrote in Swaraj in 1909. That document in Swaraj was brilliantly original. There were many ideas set forth there. Uh, yet the previous movement, Swaraj, in Bengal, uh, certainly influenced it. And uh, in particular, I think one figure has not been emphasized enough. And that is a, a leader, Bibin Chandra Pal, who uh, wrote about Swaraj profoundly, impressionably, a year before Gandhi wrote in Swaraj. Uh, Bibin Chandra Pal was writing in uh, 1906, 97, his Madras lectures, for example, were absolutely brilliant. And he forecast much of what Gandhi was saying. So we have a great deal for in Swaraj of Bengali thought, including Tagore, uh, that influenced Gandhi in 1909 and later. Bengal, as we well know, was at the forefront of the Indian nationalist movement well before Gandhi assumed uh, leadership of it. Uh, so we look to these leaders uh, for inspiration. And I've written about Vivekananda, Vivekananda was himself an immense seminal influence on Aurobindo and others. So we must give credit to uh, what Bengal contributed to the Indian nationalist movement in terms of thinking about Swaraj. Thank you, sir. I hope that's the answer uh, the question. If it's not, I'd be will I'd be happy to comment further. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Shashoto is satisfied with uh, your answer, sir. Now uh, there is another comment by Priya De. She has actually quoted the same quotation that I just talked about about what is Swaraj, it is Maya. But then there is a question: Did Tagore have any doubts? about the principles or foundations of Gandhi's movement at that time. We all know that Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore uh, were two giant thinkers of modern India with vastly different ideas of nationalism. Your comments and observations, sir. Yes, they were. The burden of my lecture was precisely that, that they were immensely different in terms of their ideas of nationalism. And uh, the quotation about Swaraj indicates that they were both profoundly concerned with the definition of Swaraj. And Gandhi and in Swaraj uh, gets credit for having set that forth. And he has been quoted from in Swaraj worldwide over and again. But Gandhi, he had other reflections about Swaraj, uh, Indian Swaraj, uh, that were important. He wrote not about nationalism. Nowhere does he mention nationalism in Indian Swaraj in 1909. He talks about Indian civilization and what is Indian civilization. And he's immensely proud of Indian civilization, writing about it in terms of it being the ideal good conduct. <clears throat> in this sense, both Gandhi and Tagore were at one in the way in which they saw Indian civilization. A whole chapter in uh, Indian Swaraj is devoted just to Indian, just to civilization, what is civilization. Uh, so they are profoundly at one in terms of this. And that civilization in India signifies a spiritual, a moral quality 
uh, that is often not present in Western civilization. And that was, that was recognized by both Tagore and Gandhi early on. Uh, are there any more questions? I don't see anything else in the chat box. So if anybody has a question, could possibly ask. Uh, Let's see, you're muted, Professor yeah. Chakrabarty. Basha, with your permission, yes. uh, may yes. I? You know, Professor Dalton, um, I am uh, fascinated and uh, not so satisfied at the same time. Please I'm go fascinated. Ahead. I'm fascinated because you really reminded me of certain ideas which I talked about in my book, uh, which was published in 2006. Yes. yes. I'm a little upset because you stopped with non-cooperation movement. Because ah. the debate between Tagore and Gandhi continued beyond non-cooperation movement. So Thank that's you. why I thought I, I thought that you would really go beyond non-cooperation movement and call up truth. Because you know the uh, interesting part uh, to me um, uh, started unfolding. Uh, actually, uh, after non-cooperation, because uh, uh, as I said at the outset, uh, Tagore was not a political activist in the sense Gandhi was, but after non-cooperation, in the context of civil disobedience, Tagore and Gandhi had a very interesting kind of dialogue, which probably I'm sure you know about it, on Bihar earthquake, 1934. Right, and there, you know, the, the the differences between them came out very sharply. While Tagore was, you know, trying to understand the the physical, um, you know, uh, trying to ex uh, you know, conceptualize earthquake as a physical phenomenon, while Gandhi, you know, explained it in terms of divine chastisement or mm -hmm. God's caprice. So, you know, that also shows that they thought differently. You know, one is highly rational, another is not so rational. Though Gandhi explained that, you know, you may uh, conceive me as irrational, uh, but, you know, in reality, I wanted to explain earthquake as God's caprice to attack those who were practicing untouchability. So it's a way of, you know, kind of scaring people. It's in a way of kind of threatening people that if you keep on practicing untouchability, probably you will find God's kind of anger pretty often. So that was Gandhi's explanation. Anyway, that's And then in 1939, when Subhash Chandra Bose was um, kicked out from the Congress after he you know, comfortably won against Gandhi nominated candidate Pattabhi Sitaramaya, uh, Tagore uh, felicitated Subhash Chandra Bose in a newly constructed hall, which was called Mahajati Shadon. And in that particular hall, Tagore addressed Bose as the kind of son of India, S-U-N, son, son of India. Um, and there he, um, in, you know, indirectly uh, criticized Gandhi for having failed to accommodate Subhash Chandra Bose, because here he said Gandhi was reduced to a very petty politician. So, you know, that's that's very interesting part and it continued. But the same Tagore um, he, uh, wanted Gandhi's help uh, about the future of Bishop Bharati. Because, you know, I have got letters in 1940. I mean, he died in 1941. He uh, wrote a letter to Gandhiji saying that, you know, I created this kind of precious seat of learning, but I'm not sure whether it was going to last after my death. So please take care. And Gandhiji said, with my utmost effort, I'll try to, you know, keep it going. And you know that Gandhiji wrote to Nehru uh, when he became the prime minister. And Bharati is the first university which was recognized as a university of national importance uh, in 1951. So, you know, I, I thought that you would go beyond non-cooperation. That's this, uh, 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 what made me upset. 
the, but one conceptual question I'd like to put before you. Now, you know, you, you kept asking, you kept, you know, arguing uh, that Tagore and Gandhi were both against the idea of nationalism. You know, I agree with that point of view. Yes, they were um, opposed to nationalism as it is conceived in the Western context. Because nationalism in the Western context means, especially after the 1648 Westphalia Treaty, it refers to homogenization of a multitude, you know, in terms of language, in terms of religion, in terms of culture, in terms of, you know, common uh, memory of operation. But you know, if you apply these criterion uh, criteria to Indian to the Indian context, I think none of them, you know, stands vis-a-vis -vis India. So I think they, from that point of view, they were together. But you know, uh, most of the people make a mistake. You know, I, I'm telling you after having, you know, done some research on this, um, they try to form their opinion of uh, Tagore's approach to nationalism on the basis of those three lectures, you refer to that, you know, nationalism, uh, the lectures in 1913, you know, nationalism in the West, nationalism in Japan, nationalism in India. Now my, you know, uh, understanding of nationalism is not confined to the reading of that text. Because uh, as I said, um, if you read Tagore's uh, you know, novels, for instance, if you read Tagore's, you know, uh, dance drama or plays, you'll find that you know, he was, uh, I think, misunderstood if you focus primarily on that particular text, um, because, you know, he was opposed to nationalism as it was conceptualized in the Western context. But he had in mind some kind of homogeneity on the basis of civilizational ethos, because neither Tagore nor Gandhi uh, uh, resorted to the expression nationalism ever. If you read Gandhi's collective works, you'll hardly find the term nation. You'll find the hard term nation only when he debated with Jinnah. But otherwise, his preferred term, you know, if you know uh, in Gujarati, is called proja. Proja means subject. So I think, you know, Gandhi was very careful that you know, India cannot be conceptualized in terms of the criteria in which na nation, nationalism, national identity is conceptualized in the Western context. Now, when it comes to Tagore, he uh, uh, understood nationalism in the sense of being patriotic, you know, a commitment to an, uh, a geographical location which is connected uh, by civilizational ethos, um, uh, which, which he explained in, in terms of a Bengali word called samaj. Because he's, you know, or society, even a broadly, if I translate samaj, it's, it broadly means society. So I think, you know, if it is wrong, it is conceptually wrong to dismiss that Tagore did not uh, conceive India as a nation because his definition of nation, nationalism, and national identity is differently conceptualized, differently conceived. And I think I wrote a book written by Radhakrishnan um, uh, on Tagore. Radhakrishnan raised this point. And he said that, you know, the Tagore conceptualized na nation, not in the sense it is understood in the Western context, but in the sense of civilizing, uh, of, a, of an unity, based on civilizational ethos. Now, so that's also some kind of homogeneity, but you know, that homogeneity takes into account the diversity, which um, uh, you will find uh, pretty evident in India. So I think, you know, if we simply focus on those three lectures, then probably you will not be able to understand Tagore's actual, you know, meaning meaning of, it, uh, of nationalism. Then I, I'll, I'll refer to some of the novels. You know, Tagore wrote one novel in the context of Swadeshi movement, you know, Ghore Bai, the home and the world. You know, it was, you know, uh, put into a film by great filmmaker Ray, you know, home and the world. And that, if you read that novel, along with another novel, which was published in 1910, Gora, 
um, and then in 1923, you know, Charodhai. If you take them together along with that, those lectures, then you'll find Tagore was opposed to nationalism if it is conceptualized in the Western criteria. But Tagore had in mind some kind of, you know, unifying code, you know, for lack of better word, I would say it's nationalism or patriotism. Uh, and I think, you know, this is something which is being, which is being missed by most of the scholars, uh, especially you know, scholars who don't have access to the Bengali, you know, the text of Tagore. Because, you know, if you take them together, you'll find that he was interested in, you know, in unifying India. And, you know, I, I would say it's kind of homogenization. Now, homogenization per se is not bad as far as Tagore is concerned, but homogenization in terms of putting everything in one box is wrong. So I think you know, we have to put forward in a nuanced way the notion of nationalism, which Tagore put forward. I, I think, you know, as I told you, that you know, that's why Tagore has become very close to my heart than Gandhiji, because Tagore's idea was far more complex, far more you know, context-driven than Gandhi, because it, it is quite natural. You know, Gandhi was essentially a political leader. To me, you know, he, he was more a political leader, less a thinker. But Tagore, more a thinker, less a kind of you know, leader of any kind. So nowadays, if you, if you read Tagore's you know, text um, in between lines, especially the vernacular text, then you'll find a different kind of you know, outlook on which Tagore put forward to conceptualize nation, nationalism, and national identity in a different perspective. You know, I'm just uh, giving you my uh, idea of uh, approaching Tagore's idea of nationalism. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm putting this before you to get your reaction so that I know whether I'm in the right direction or not. Professor Chakrabarty, your learning is awesome. Thank and you. I, pleasure. <laughs> and I appreciate uh, the incisive point that you've just made that reveal your overwhelming knowledge Thank of you. Tagore. And we are in agreement on so many things. Now you and I, before this lecture started, discussed our common mentors in SOAS, in the School of Oriental African Studies. Sure. There I gave a series of lectures. This was only the first one. Uh -oh. on Tagore and Gandhi. And they were attended by Hugh Tinker, Morris Jones, C.H. Phillips, all of our friends. Sure, and sure. so I plead to you uh, that I have given only the first of these lectures, stopping. If I had the opportunity to continue, uh, then uh, I'm not sure that I could match at all your wisdom about Tagore in the subsequent lecture. But my plea is for you to consider the fact that this was only the first of lectures that I gave on uh, Tagore and Gandhi. And I, in this relatively brief period of time, I have benefited from your comments enormously. Thank you. Now, when I continue, I, you Tinker wrote a book on C.F. Andrews that you've probably seen called The Ordeal of Love. It was a biography of uh, Andrews and his relationship with Gandhi. And he discussed Tagore a great deal. Uh, the Ordeal of Love is an excellent title, I think, because between Gandhi and Tagore, there was also a kind of ordeal of love. And that ordeal of love was fraught by many disagreements, but also by an underlying sympathy. Sure. Sure. Uh, I'm struck, for example, as you know, the story of how in 1932, Gandhi broke his fast. Mm. You remember the fast against That's untouchability, it. which- uh, Puna, 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 you know- you, The Puna fast. Fact. That's right. And Tagore, you remember, rose out of a sick bed to travel to Pune from his home. And he was not well at all during this arduous journey. And he went there with one purpose, 
and that was to congratulate Gandhi on the fad and on and Tagore held to him, gave to him the juice that broke the fad. They were both, in terms, I've talked about this a good deal with Kara Lal, who was there. At the but time. President Dalton, I, yeah. I just would like to you know, add one piece of information to you. That yes, yes, Tagore went to Pune and you know, Gandhi broke fast after having taken that glass of juice. But at the same time, Gandhi asked Tagore to sing a song. Yes. And Tagore wrote, uh, Tagore you know, sang that song, Shagor Jakhon Shukhae Jai. So Very I think, nice. you know, yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And Tagore, so I was about to say that I talked about this at length with Jarl Al Nair, uh, who was there at the time. And he said that he had never seen two people so close as to Gore and Gandhi at that moment. They were both in tears, embracing, and Gandhi making tributes to Tagore and back and forth. Do you see what I mean? It's an ordeal of love and that is just after that, Tagore, as you rightly said, condemned Gandhi over the earthquake and it incident and the whole attitude in terms of science. You're absolutely right. So we go back and forth, don't we? in terms of the Gore-Gandhi relationship. Mm -hmm. We have them in 1932 embracing in tears over a common affirmation of humanity. And then uh, only a couple of years later, we have uh, a strong criticism of one and the other. And when the we had earthquake. Died, that's right. Yeah, that's right, with the earthquake. Yeah. So you're um, absolutely right to highlight the differences between them. And uh, I would agree with that. And my Thank lecture you. was in it an attempt to do that until but it did stop in 1921. If I had continued, uh, then I would have talked about the way in which the Gore responded to Gandhi in the fast, the Pune fast, and the way it, it, uh, they were so much at one in that respect. Sure. Uh, so then now, we, I, now, Professor Dalton, I'll make a request to you that you know I'll ask Nimai to be in touch with you for, for the second lecture. So ah. may I interrupt you for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So Nimai, please talk yes. to get in touch with Professor Dalton for the second lecture. <laughs> so you then know, you can come go beyond uh, the non-cooperation movement. <laughs> you know, I think you would be able to give that lecture much better than I. No, no, I but you know, I would like to amazing. would like to hear from you because since you said you gave a lecture, a series of lectures in SOAS, uh, where all the you know, luminaries uh, were there. So I'm sure I'd like to hear from you. Mm. I wish you had been there. That was uh, but, among the luminaries. But I'm 65, sure. no, I reached London in 1980. So by that time, you know, when oh, I was 65, I was a student of school. You're such a young man. I'm sorry I saw. <laughs> <laughs> no, not so young uh, as I see, uh, appeared to be. But, you know. Uh, yes. Uh, and yes. then, uh, just to finish, I, I haven't even begun to answer your question. But just to uh, finish the way in which Gandhi gave when at Tagore's death, uh, such a moving tribute to Tagore, and included in the mm. radical volume, uh, the way in which uh, Gandhi appreciated Tagore's contribution so enormously. And there were many testimonies uh, to this. And if I were to give a second lecture, I would read uh, from my correspondence with Pierre Law. Pierre Law and I were very close correspondents. Mm -hmm. Uh, during this time. It hasn't been published, it's private correspondence, but Pyrrhalal insisted on the way in which this ordeal of love, this deep, profound affection between these two giants of India uh, were both affirmative and negative. That is, <clears throat> Tagore had, he was a Nobel Prize winner in a well-known literature. And Gandhi could never have approached in literature anything remotely like that. But Pierre Law was an English major, and uh, he appreciated Tagore, Tagore's poetry. And he and Nirmal Kumar Bose was also in mm -hmm. the poetry at this time, uh, and he appreciated it. And the way in which these two, as I said, titanic figures complemented one another with as you rightly said, Tagore writing in Bengali, superb literature, 
place, a home in the world, you're absolutely correct. Oh, it was a magnificent work that Gandhi could never have written. By the same token, Tagore could not have written Hind Swaraj. Mm -hmm. The sure. reading, the two complement one another. So my argument in the second and third was back and forth. And the intriguing part of this, for me, is the way in which it represents a dialogue in archetypal form. It's a quintessential expression of dialogue. There are works about dialogue that distinguish between a dialogue and a discussion. And a dear friend of mine, he's a philosopher at the University of, of uh, Victoria in Canada, James Tully, I've been in correspondence with him a great deal. You may not have heard of him, but he's written an excellent introduction uh, to Richard Gregg's Power of oh, Nonviolence. Nonviolence, that's right, yeah. Yes, uh, so you mm -hmm. check on Tully's work, and he's a close friend of mine now. And he distinguishes between discussion and dialogue. A discussion is when two people are trying to top one another and to win a particular argument. A dialogue is one in which people join together, as you and I are right now, in a common attempt to complement ideas one or another, with no intention of being adversarial at all between you and I now, but rather to be complementary and to, in some way, then bring out various truths. And so I respect enormously what you've just said, as Professor Tully would, in, in terms of a dialogue. I think that dialogues are rare today. And so my argument would be in the second lecture and after that, would be that he and Tagore, Gandhi and Tagore, represent in this quintessential manner dialogue. Now this art form of dialogue is precious and needs to be performed in my country now, as you know, from the bitter political disputes that have gone on over the last several years. There is no dialogue. There is only debate and vicious, cruel debate going on between the Republicans and the Democrats, the blue states and the red states, that sort of thing. Gandhi and de Gore represent the finest kind of exchange, imaginable, embracing one another at various times, tributes to one another. And I think that you are so right about examining Gandhiji's collected works. If you look at the collected works, and you, you said this essentially, the subject index, for example, mm -hmm. you'll see numerous references to civilization in Gandhi's work, but very few to nationalism. Only, I don't know what, most a half dozen, but civilization, you're, numerous references. And that's what Gandhi is trying to get at, I think, the nature of civilization, Indian civilization. And at one point in the collected works, um, Gandhi said, I'm quoting now from Gandhi. Um, he says, if we are, is in, he's writing to Andrews in 1924, and he says, violent nationalism, otherwise known as imperialism, is the curse. And that is the curse of the West. Nonviolent nationalism is a necessary condition of corporate or civilized life. And then later in writing to William Shire, a sympathetic American journalist whom you know, my nationalism, Gandhi wrote, as my, is, as my religion is not exclusive, but inclusive. And they must be so consistently with welfare of all life. So he's trying, as you can see, in use of this word nationalism, he's trying to carve out a particular form of nationalism that is consonant with his view of civilization. Mm -hmm. It is nonviolent, notice, it is not at all like the violent nationalism of the West, which he says is synonymous with, with violence and imperialism, that, that's the thrust of it. Now, Tagore, of course, the courage of this man, think of it now, during 1916, traveling the world and uh, 
expounding against nationalism when nationalism is at its height in America and Britain. It's, un, it's mind boggling that he should speak in this way and then return to India. Gandhi did not have that courage at this time. As we know, Gandhi actively supported World War I. And he not only supported it, as you know, I'm only speaking what you know well, uh, he acted as a recruitment officer. That's right. That's right. And uh, recruited Indians for unsuccessfully in 1917 uh, for uh, World War I. Tagore would not have thought of that as anything like that. He courageously opposed World War I and spoke against the nationalism there. And so they differed in this way profoundly in terms of their attitudes towards World War I and nationalism. And yet they would come back together again and then go away. And it's, it's just a beautiful relationship. It is. There's, yes. no, there's, there's nothing like it really anywhere in, in the world. And if only in my country, there were something remotely approaching this kind of dialogue, Professor Chappell, that would be a magnificent blessing and gift to America. We have nothing, nothing like that. Mm. And it's very sad that we should be, we should lack this kind of civil exchange among political leaders or cultural leaders. So I hold up this as, this is my second lecture, I hold up this as a magnificent example of two great intellectuals engaged in a common quest for the meaning of civilization. Sure, thank you. It, it, it's absolutely unique and we must cherish it. Thank you. It all but thank, thank you, you. And, and I apologize for not addressing half of the questions that you brilliantly raised. No, I think that's why I said you have to come back. <laughs> yes. Sir, may I come in for a minute? Yes. Please do. Well, uh, for my part, this has been such a thought-provoking discussion. I just can't refrain from saying a few things. That is, I agree with Professor Bidu Chakraborty, Chancellor, sir, that uh, what you said earlier, I totally agree that Tagore is lost only in his literary creations. There was more to Tagore, and that needs more and more, uh, you know, uh, publications and things, uh, representation. And secondly, uh, his nationalism, his ideas on nationalism cannot be limited to the three essays that he wrote. His nationalism, his patriotism is to be looked into from the work that he started ever since he went to, uh, to Shilai Daho with his rural reconstruction work. His entire idea of patriotism, what he was saying later on, that is actually um, you know, the blueprint of this in Shadishishwans, which is there, the rural reconstruction work, his whole idea about how the country could revive itself, rural resuscitation, as I prefer to call it, that was there. So these are my uh, humble uh, observations. And uh, there are uh, a few observations and comments. I would just like to read it out. Uh, Professor Dalton, if you would like to respond to them, it would be very good. Uh, one, uh, Professor Asha Mukherjee, she writes, the difference between the concept of Swaraj and nationalism itself leads to the ultimate difference between the two great thinkers. But interestingly, both were deeply rooted in the efforts to change Indian society. This is one uh, uh, issue that she's raised and she's asking for a comment on that. And another thing she also writes, the difference between the humanism that has been prevalent in the West is not the same Tagore is talking about. Being human in Tagore is an ideal as well as existential. These are her comments. And there's also another observation that Rock uh, Chokhirbali uh, would also be included uh, this text in his understanding of Tagore. And then there is uh, Professor uh, Shanjai Malik. He has written, and I would like to read, uh, read it out, Krishna Kripalini in his biography on the poet referred to Leonard Elmer's recollection of the 1921 meeting between Tagore and Gandhi, which ends with Rabindranath saying, Poems I can spin, songs I can spin, <laughs> but what a mess I would make, Gandhiji, of your precious cotton. Uh, this is the 
and not only Vivekananda, Aurobindo, and others, but we find it in unlikely figures like Madhavendranath Roy, M. N. Roy. We find it in the later works of Ambedkar, who is so often sent, set against Gandhi, and so in his Buddha and his Dhamma uh, in 1956, he will make the same connection in terms of Buddhism. This is a vital stream in Indian in Indian thought, and it's a magnificent contribution to world thinking about freedom. It is, uh, in terms of any contribution that I may have made uh, to an analysis of freedom, it's in this sense, and I want to emphasize this overall. Uh, now, uh, finally, the questions that were uh, just asked. From my point of view, and again, I have already said this to Professor Chakravarti. From my point of view, the relationship between Gandhi and de Gaulle needs to be emphasized in a very personal way and not simply a political matter. They did have their differences, but the deep affection between these two people is astounding. We must not miss this when we talk about the personal and the political, the way in which they were at one in terms of that. Think of, try to think of political and social leaders elsewhere in your country right now and in mine who can come together in a common embrace of thinking about freedom or civilization or whatever. Try to name them now. That is adversary. When I spoke to Jai Prakash Narayan, for example, who was, you remember, in 1975 imprisoned by Indira Gandhi, and I asked him, What is, I was very close to Jai Prakash because we joined in the movement against Indira Gandhi the emergency. I asked him, What is the common feature that joins Gandhi and de Gaulle? And he unhesitatingly said, their common sense of humanity. And that brought them together in a closeness. They were giants. We will not see the likes of them soon. They were unique in terms of their relationship. And I want to emphasize this with all the passion in my command that people that I've spoken to in India, like Jai Prakash Narayan, especially Nirmal Kumar Bose, who was one of my mentors, they saw this quality. So the affection, the deep affection between these two individuals and the way in which it influenced them. Let this not be lost when we emphasize their differences. They did have differences. But the underlying, as Jai Prakash said so well, the underlying feature uh, was uh, their commonality. I uh, know I'm sure, Professor Rao, I've not uh, hit the question that you enumerated. If you could recall for me uh, some of those, for example, that wonderful line of Tagore in 1921 saying that to God, yeah, I can spin. Uh, lyrics, poetry, and write plays, and oh, sing songs, and Gandhi could not. Gandhi never composed anything like the literature that Tagore approached, and yet he was not for a moment antagonistic towards Tagore in that respect. He knew the giant who had won the Nobel Prize in literature. That's true. Both held each other in great respect. I think, That's Vipasha, true. it's almost nine o'clock, two hours. Oh, so I think yes, we must. Sure. No, Professor Dalton, I, I just asked Vipasha that you have been speaking for almost two hours. So I think <laughs> I, I, I should not stretch it beyond that. 
uh, otherwise you will not come next time <laughs> <laughs> so and what's the time now there because i see it's early morning the time now is 8:30 a.m. okay in uh, portland oregon yeah, yeah, it's Oregon. Yeah. Anyway, because uh, Mipasha, if you have anything very, you know, very pressing to ask, you can go ahead. Otherwise, I think we oh, should. Please uh, do. Please do. I mean, it's morning for me. You are the oh, one. But you know, I think it's you are, yeah, fascinating. It's, it's, uh, it is. It is. And I always uh, get uh, involved in this. Any discussion on Tagore? Tagore mm -hmm. I've been working on for years now, and Gandhi I've been teaching for years now. So both are very close to me, to my heart. Yeah. That's why. So I'll stop now. I'll refrain from adding anything else because, as Sir said, we'll have you the next time, second time. Then we'll find the day with my questions and observations. Too, but for kind. today, we'll call it a day. But thank you, oh, Mr. Dalton. It's been a great experience for me because I, when I was a student at one time reading all your works, and I never imagined that one day I would be you know, or, uh, anchoring this session like this and talking to you. So for me, on a personal note, it has been uh, extremely satisfying. Thank you, sir. I must uh, just ask uh, our Pastoria, uh, sir. To no, no, I think you know, I will give a word of thanks to Professor Dalton. You know, I think Nimai is the link between you and Vishwabharati. I started the discussion. Uh, I started by sending you a uh, uh, dialogue. I started the dialogue with you by sending you an email. And the email I got from Sanjeev, and then it was Nimai who carried it forward. So I think Nimai right. has should have the right to express a uh, word of thanks to you. And I, as I told you, you have to come back. So again, Nimai will you know be in touch with you to fix a date according to your convenience, so that you can hear the second part of the lecture. <laughs> yes, yes. Very kind of you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been entirely my privilege, my pleasure, my opportunity and, to engage with you. And also my request, uh, Professor Dalton, um, that you know normally we uh, upload the lecture in the YouTube. So if you have no objection, we'll do it as quickly as possible. Oh, no, no objection. No objection, okay. And another request is that you know whoever uh, spoke on this uh, series, they are introduced as a member of our family. So Good. I welcome you to this, uh, to Vishwabharati family. And I request you to come physically at your convenience um, in near future. Because I, I don't want to ask you to come now because of pandemic, but I'm sure the pandemic will disappear soon. And I would like, we look forward to having you in our campus. I look forward to that too, and I appreciate your invitation. Thank I'm you. honored by it. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Well, Nimai. Uh, 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 yeah, it's uh, yes. yeah, at the very outset, let me extend our warm regard on behalf of the Sohati family and on behalf of the Sohati lecture series to Professor Denis uh, Dalton, sir. Not only for this delivering uh, his fascinating lecture and useful lecture, but also I have 29 male communication with him, and he's inspiring me really a lot that how to communicate a person like him. And he always uh, accepts me whatever I do, he always appreciates me. This is a nice way of communication. So I am very really grateful, sir. Uh, that's a kind of lesson to me to communicate with you, uh, who is a fellow, uh, who is a very really teacher of teachers to me, particularly. If I, as you, my duty is my teacher, then you happen to be the teacher of teachers. So uh, I pay my homage and regard to you. And at the same time, let me uh, welcome you for your second lecture, maybe I was at 32. And uh, when we were able to uh, listen to your second part of lecture. And of course, uh, if I must say, uh, my one of the thanks to my son, sir, was a teacher, course, because he is actually this great child. To, to found it as a lecture series, and through this lecture series, we are able to introduce ourselves and listen to many academic galaxies from the world, not only India, not only parts of country, but also world. So now, actually, the story is going to be done as a kind of international university. Last two years, we have listened to many different personalities from different parts of 
So, Professor Dalton, we will expect you in the near future for the second part of your lecture. Right? So, that's a, that's a Gandhian commitment, I guess. It's so kind of you. You are in touch with so many eminent scholars and uh, your wisdom. You have, as I said, youth on your side. And you could give this lecture far better than I. No, but still, I appreciate the invitation. And thank you, thank you. So we'll be in touch with you soon. Thank you, thank you, Professor. And, and uh, enjoy your breakfast. <laughs> and and uh, I'll uh, have my dinner. Enjoy <laughs> your dinner. Your... <laughs> uh, mine will be ours. Will be dinner. Your yours will be breakfast. I look forward to when I can come to your campus. Please, please do. As I said, you are now a member of our Paribar in the family. So Thank whenever you, it's convenient, just let us know. Uh, we'll be really honored you know, uh, to receive you as a kind of revered guest of, uh, uh, of the fraternity in the campus. Thank you. So Namaskar. Namaste, Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you.